joining today's webinar. We have a terrific webinar for you today on the new Stride training plans. And these were designed in partnership with Coach Steve Palladino. And Steve is our special guest today. Uh, welcome, Steve. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be able to, to share these plans and, and talk about them a little bit. And introducing Coach Steve Palladino, I'm sure many of you who are watching uh, know Coach Steve Palladino, and he is the founder of the Palladino Power Project. He is a leading expert on training and racing with a running power meter, a medical professional for 30 plus years, a former 216 marathoner and 1980 U.S. Olympic trials qualifier. And for anyone who is active in the strike community on Facebook or the Palladino Power Project, You'll be familiar with Steve for his considerable knowledge, always willing to share, give very comprehensive answers, help all uh, runners out in their training, and you know, always that expert opinion on running power. So once again, we're excited to have Coach Paladino here to discuss the training plans. Uh, Steve, anything else you want to touch on in regards to your background, passion for running, running experience? Well, I mean, I, I, I would just have, have the viewers look at that third bullet. My, my background is in medicine and treating a lot of runners over that time as along with the coaching and, and in my prior running as well. So my focus is not just about performance, building performance. It's also, you know, managing training load and trying to keep people steer people clear of injury. Um, uh, so uh, the, I think that the, 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 all of those bullet points combine to, uh, go into what I try to accomplish in the plans. And that, that, is, that will be a recurring theme in, um, you know, balance recovery and, you know, especially with the introduction of supplemental training to help runners prime and recover. I think that uh, runners are going to see that reflected in many times across the, uh, the philosophy and the, the, you know, the structure behind the plans. So for today's presentation, it will be broken into four parts. We're going to be talking about the plans, the importance of testing your fitness, how to choose the right plan for you, and modifying the plans. And uh, we're going to be breaking these down in each uh, really uh, section and giving you a lot of details behind these plans. Um, Steve, before we get started, could you tell us uh, about your motivation behind the plans and what you hope to see runners accomplish with these plans? Well, I, I, of course, the... the you know, the, the primary purpose is to, to improve port performance over time uh, using the, 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 the plentiful benefits of, of running in the run with power paradigm um, and taking advantage of, of the, the various metrics and so forth that Stride offers to achieve this purpose of improving performance. But as I mentioned Early, I also try to do it in a sensible way that um, that keeps people from injury, and that's one of the, the the concepts that I and reasons why I developed the the levels based on CP. Um, it, it forcing it, just like goal time plans, forcing you know square peg into a round hole it, is going to you know lead to an injury if someone's going way over their head. Uh, so those are some of the concepts I've, I'm trying to develop performance, but do it in a, a way that's sensible and help, keeps people healthy, injured, and allowed to stay consistent from plan to plan to plan over time. And that's where the true growth comes. You use the, uh, the term uh, power paradigm here, and I think this is really one of the most important concepts. And really the first concept we're going to be talking about here is the power, power, uh, power paradigm versus uh, something runners may be more traditionally familiar with, which is the goal time plans. And you have this terrific chart here. Um, Steve, can you take us through the components outlined in this chart and break down the differences between a power paradigm plan and a goal time plan? Yeah. So let me start with a goal time plan. Goal time plan uh, it requires the, the athlete to sort of pick the, the correct goal time for them. Uh, the, you know, there may not uh, be a testing component going into the plan. So it's possible for the athlete to go over their head, get injured. And that's why, you know, a lot of plans historically have a very high injury and dropout rate when they're goal time because people get in over their head. So you look at this diagram and instead of 
starting in at the bottom level, they may be starting in, you know, a, a couple of loops below the top. And, um, and, and that just doesn't work. So in the power paradigm, you, you're going to test to assess your current level of fitness. And one of the primary markers of that is critical power and auto CP um, is, is one way of assessing or, or estimating critical power. So you get people in and at their, their true fitness level, and then they, they, you have a plan that's, that's sensible and progresses them along, so points two and three. And then you retest because there may be some growth in fitness. And by doing that, uh, let's say you establish a new CP, you know, the third time around this wheel here um, or the spiral. Um, and now your training targets adjust accordingly. So if CP is going up, your training targets they may still be, let's say, 98% uh, of CP might be an interval target. Still the same relative intensity, but now instead of 300 watts, let's say you, you jumped uh, a percent, now it's 303 watts. The same relative, but you're progressing intensity because you're retesting periodically. Um, and of course, if you're doing this in a sensible fashion and testing and progressing wisely, you're going to stay consistent and you have this, this growth. That, in essence, is the power paradigm. Uh, and I think it's, it's, more, uh, it's more fruitful and it is uh, superior to, let's say, a goal time plan. And for uh, more details on this, we actually did a 90-minute webinar on this around two years ago. And this is something we'll put in the uh, description of this video. It's called Setting Achievable Training Goals with Stride. And it really covers and d dives deep into this topic alone. And in terms of what will your finishing time be when you execute a power-based training plan? What, how, what, what kind of factors go into that, Steve? Like what determines how fast I'm going to run on race day when I do grab a power-based training plan? Yeah, the, the, I get, get that question a lot historically. You know, I mean, I've been writing plans for you know, six, six years or so. Um, and someone will say, well, is, it, is this plan going to allow me to break three hours? Well, there's some... <laughs> If you look at this this particular diagram, there's so many factors that determine the performance on rest, race day. Of course, you know, if we start from the top and go clockwise, you know your fit, your entering level of fitness, where your starting point is, um, your ability to, uh, you know, how healthy you are, whether you're you're entering the plan with a history of injuries or not, um, your compliance with the plan, your the, your avoidance of injury during the plan, how you response, everybody responds a little bit differently. So you could have two people do the same plan, start same starting fitness, but one responds a little bit differently than the other. That's going to ch change performance for each of those two athletes. And then, of course, you get to race day, and you and now it's it's dumping rain and wind which you didn't plan for, or it's, it's a hotter day than normal. So conditions on race day and then how, you, how well you execute. If you go off and, and you're work, running way over your head in the beginning, you know what's going to happen. You're going to crash and burn. So all of these elements determine performance. So you can't say, oh, this, is, this plan is going to bring you to three hours. It's all of these things are considered in that. And, and, you know, if you if really examine what Stride has to offer with the race planner, with training load management, with these plans, a lot of these 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 points are um, are facilitated by what Stride offers, uh, so that you get the best performance. But it's it's really hard to say, yes, this plan is going to give you X Y Z time at the get go. You, there's so many factors that are going to play, so many variables that are going to play along the way. And I, I love that point you just made in that uh, any of these things you're struggling with, let's say you're struggling for race execution, you're struggling with, uh, you know, sticking, uh, executing a training plan as prescribed. There is a stride feature for nearly all these points that can help you uh, really improve your performance, improve your skill at, at each of these individual bullet points to ultimately improve your performance on race day. So uh, for any of these features, just look to the stride ecosystem, look to the features in the app and say, you know, 
if I need help with race execution, uh, I should probably be using the Stride Workout app or the Stride app on Apple Watch in order to really stick to my power target on race day. And each of these things can be targeted and improved so you can have that improved performance. Uh, the next point, and this is one we've gotten a lot of questions on, especially for folks coming from other training plans, training of power for the first time, is the meaning of quality over quantity. And Steve, how would you, you know, how would you really describe this point of quality over quantity? Well, I mean, it up until uh, more recently, and particularly with the introduction of the power paradigm and, and training load uh, metrics, the way of, of assessing uh, progression in uh, of training load in, in runners is is purely volume. But we have uh, RSS running stress score. Um, we have a training load metric that incorporates both duration and relative power. So if you look at that little formula for RSS there, notice it's run duration is a key component and power divided by CP. That's their percentage of CP for that particular run. Um, so that's relative, your relative intensity. Both of those components are included in uh, training load. And so some runners are going, well, I'm used to a higher volume plan. You got to ask the question, well, what? how much intensity was was included in that plan? You can't <clears throat> just say this plan is lower volume, so it's not going to be as effective as the higher volume plan. It's really about the load, and that's what we're managing here. And load, in it, as we're talking about it, includes both duration as well as relative intensity. So if you look at that little uh, diagram on the uh, on the right on the right of your screen, there it, show, it just demonstrates a level four marathon plan and and sort of gives you an example of how the load progresses over time. Um, so you gotta understand that that these the load it includes both duration as well as as well as relative intensity. And you know, there, there's an old sale saying that uh, if all you do is run long and slow, it, it's going to teach you to run really well long and slow. Um, you, you have to have a, a proper mix of appropriate intensity, and you got to progress that intensity, the volume of that intensity um, across various domains. And that's how you achieve, uh, you know, improving your performance over time. So you can't just look at the volume of the plan. Compare also the the uh, the volume of the intensity and the nature of the intensity, the distribution of the intensity. And also on this image on the right hand side, we have the peak workout examples and. You know, Steve, would you say if I complete these peak workout examples, if I hit these durations at these prescribed powers, that's basically means I'm on track. That means I'm going to have an excellent race if I'm able to execute all these peak workout examples at these intensities for these durations. Yeah, well, I, I, I what I did is I those peak workouts, that's everything builds to that peak workout. And the what you achieve in that peak workout is what you're handing off to your your yourself as a as a racer. So yeah, these are designed so you are um, for your particular level, you're ready to race effectively. And tips for proper execution of the plan. I picked some of the top workouts. I was reading through your guide, and I really like these uh, tips a lot. And uh, I was hoping you could uh, dive a little deeper, touch on some of these points on what really you know, means what, what proper execution of the plan really means. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think the, the first and foremost point point is that runners are performance driven, most runners. And so, um, and, and, and they use the, the concept, if, if as a little is good, then more is better. Not necessarily the point The the idea is hit the targets prescribed and if, if, the, if you're basing off of a valid CP, then the target's going to be right. The stimulus is going to be right. And you move on. Check the box and move on. So 
Um, that's that's a primary point. Don't don't be a workout wonder. Um, hit the points, check the box, move on, and allow that spiral to happen over time. Allow your fitness to come to you rather than you forcing the fitness. So try to stay in the ranges. And just a side point on that. Some people uh, will, will talk about, well, my power bounces around a lot. And sometimes it's above that target range. Well, that's the nature of power. It's bouncy. It's, it's stochastic. The idea here is keeping your average power, your lap power in that target range. That's, that's the goal. If, if, if the, tar- the average power is in the target range, but you're bouncing up and down and so forth, that's okay. It's where the target power lies. Um, on, on easy runs, this is really important. Keep easy runs easy. And the way to do that is, is one, keep them under that ceiling of 80%. Um, that's going to help you recover and get ready for the next hard workout. That's a key thing. Um, and on the easy days, avoid that, that, that um, hilly run, a really hilly run, because it's not just about your your running stress score and that percentage of CP staying under 80%. It's also the mechanical load as well. Um, Gus had a, a great point on this before we went on that, that stride allows you to look at your mechanical load as well. So um, if you, you'll, you can do two easy runs at 80% or 79%, whatever, pick a number under 80, but one's done on the flat and one's done on a really hilly route, the mechanical load is going to be higher on that hilly route because the, the downhill running is has a higher mechanical load. So uh, Stride's giving you the tools to, to really follow these plans, um, but, you know, don't, don't fall into the, 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 you know, a little, a little is good and, and more is better. Um, and another thing on higher intensity workouts, we, we change from day to day. You know, one day we're feeling great and we could, ex, you know, I could blow this workout away. No, don't blow it away. Start at the bottom. And if you're feeling good, then step up within the target range, step, step up the next rep then the next rep, and so then you end up near the target end, high end of the target range. But there's going to be days where you're not feeling as good. You don't want to start at that high end of the target range. Don't, don't be that performance-driven. If you're in the, the most target ranges that I prescribed here, they're what, about 3% wide. So if you're at the bottom versus the top, you're still getting the same stimulus. So why not start at the bottom? And feel yourself out. Is this going to be a good day or a bad day? If it's a good day, then you allow yourself to progress within that range. If not, you keep it down on the low end. Don't worry about it because you're still going to get the same appropriate stimulus that we're looking for. And I love that last point because uh, that strategy really helps me deal with anxiety for really difficult runs, saying, how can I exceed that hard work I put in last week? It was so difficult. I don't know if I can go above that. Well, when you when you ramp into it, you, it allows you to build that confidence and really execute the plan and surprise yes. yourself. Yes. Um, th- I, this is a, 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 you know, there's a lot on this slide, um, but here's the here's the the main point that i want to make the training plans give you what to do on the left hand side the training load what you know what kind of training you're doing it even gives you supplemental training but what the training plan doesn't tell you is how much sleep you need to get the proper nutrition etc and that's the part that that's the hidden piece that you really have to focus on the harder you train, the harder you have to recover. Um, so remember, the training plans is, are, are about that left-hand side, but you have to consider yourself a training athlete and achieving optimal balance. You have to make sure you're balancing your recovery to the training load. 
And I love this fulcrum because it shows you just can't push down hard on one side. You just can't purely recover and hope your performance is going to be well. And you just can't purely trade and hope your performance is going to be great. You have to do both. And supplemental training, this is a really awesome feature, something that, um, you know, really is critical to running and that it's often forgotten about. Um, Steve, can you tell us about the purpose of supplemental training? Yeah, well, the, um, the you know, you can read the bullet points where, where number one is we're using it as part of a priming uh, prior to run, particularly higher intensity runs, but all runs basically is doing a little priming um, to get you ready to run. But also they, they, they're they designed to, or, or you know, hope, hopefully one of the outcomes is that it makes you more resilient, a little bit more uh, higher injury resistance. And then the last point is some of them may provide some improvements in, in running performance. For example, plyometrics. Um, plyometrics have been shown to improve running economy, uh, or running effectiveness, and um, they that that in turn improves your your speed to power ratio, and uh, so some of them will uh, have the potential of improving your performance. Um, just a, another comment on the supplemental training: there there are a number of different elements, as depicted here in those three elements. There, they're they're optional. If if you feel it's too much. For you, then don't do them. But I put them there because if if we're creating a best case scenario for a plan, all of these things can be helpful. Um, now, if if you're dropping things, the things I'd encourage you not to drop is the priming stuff that's before runs, and um, the uh, the stuff like uh, the the gluten hamstring work which helps prevent uh, injuries, maybe, maybe improve performance. But yeah, you can drop things, but realize that all of them are, are combined with the training program designed to help get you ready to run, reduce your injury risk, and maybe uh, improve some performance as well. And a little teaser here, we're going to have new videos demonstrating these supplemental trainings from Olympic athlete, Olympic runner Val Constein. And she has super crisp form. The videos are super clear. They're super short, you, so you can quickly watch them before you execute your supplemental training. So stay tuned for that. We're going to be having a big announcement on that next week. Uh, jumping into the next part of our presentation, testing your fitness. And this is a, as you mentioned earlier, this is a really critical part of the power paradigm. Yeah, so the um, testing... Um, is important for number one, getting you at the proper uh, training intensities to begin a plan. Testing is important to reassess any progression in your critical power to uh, readjust those, those uh, training targets. And at the end, all that testing plus the, the work that you're doing in the plan is all going to optimize the stride race planner. So, Really, testing is the crux of getting your, your training targets right, getting the race planner right, getting your training load metrics right. Because remember that one uh, formula had CP in, in uh, the, the formula. So having CP right makes the training load metrics um, more valid as well. So it testing facilitates all of these downline metrics, auto CP, power duration model, race planner, training load metrics. And for testing domains, uh, yeah, what, what constitutes a test? What, what key components do you have to have? What kind of testing should you do to really, um, you know, fulfill all the requirements? Well, this is about how, how do we keep the model happy? The power duration model, which which produces your auto CP, we want a valid auto CP. So we want to, in turn, make the model happy. The best way; these are the three key domains um, in testing this model. One is in the two to three minute range. The next, the middle 
uh, duration is nine to 12 minutes. And then the longer duration is 20 to 40 minutes. If we have a maximum effort or a race in any of those domains at satisfying uh, testing that key, key domain. Uh, so these are all important. The levels, the plan levels, it, uh, it, if you really go through it and uh, look at it, the, the, the domain, uh, the actual duration varies from, from level to level. So level two might have uh, a two minute domain and, and level four might have a three minute. Uh, but they're both satisfying that two to three minute domain. Um, so this is the key. We want to have these three elements, those all checked off to keep the model happy, which keeps auto CP happy, which keeps race planner happy and, and your training load metrics. So I liked one of the phrases you used uh, just a few minutes ago, and that was letting the fitness come to you. And if you are executing at the right power ranges, you're letting the fitness come to you. And really the next part of that is determining, um, you know, as the fitness comes to you, how much is it improved and when does it improve? And I think that ties in really well with testing recency here. Yes. And um, I, I mentioned the key domains, but also, part of keeping the model happy. Remember the mo the model that's producing all these, the, the auto CP is using your last 90 days. And ideally some of that, you know, if, if your, your fitness eight weeks ago is different than your fitness today. So you, you, you want to keep your, your assessment of your fitness, your auto CP, fairly recent and up to date. So each of those key domains should be tested about every four to eight weeks. If it gets older than eight weeks, then eh, it's, it may not be reflecting what your real fitness is, the model that is. So old test data can maybe result in an inaccurate auto CP. It might be close, but it may not be as accurate as you want. And then even worse, if there's no test data or, you know, let's say you're missing one of the key components, then your auto CP estimate may not be truly valid. So really testing is about both those three key domains as well as keeping them relatively recent. Now, within a training plan, every training plan has these, these elements the three key domains, as well as recency, all built into the plan. The only time where you have to be, uh, you have to ask the question of yourself is before a plan. Have you checked the boxes as far as the three key elements or three key domains? And is it relatively recent? Have you tested within the last four to eight weeks? Um, so, but once you're into a plan, it's taken care of for you. It's part of the plan. And uh, as you just mentioned, uh, before starting plan, what are the options for testing before starting plan? How can I meet these requirements, make sure I'm starting out the right foot as I'm entering in, into my maintenance plan, my, my build plan uh, for my next race? Yeah. So the, the, um, the first option, let's say, you're already in one of these new plans. And then you're going to, you know, you let's say it's a 10K plan. And then you're going to take a week or two of recovery and you're going right into the next plan. Well, you just, you just tested recently and you just raced a, a 10K recently. You don't need to, to um, retest. Everything's done. So if you had a recent race and you've done some recent, um, testing in the, across those domains, then you're good. You're ready to go into the next plan. Um, if you have, let's say you haven't raced, but you've done testing in the three key domains in the last six weeks, then again, you're ready to go. That's option number two. You already have an optimized 
power duration curve. That's what I call optimize. It, the three key domains have all been checked and they're relatively recent. That's an optimized power duration curve. Um, if either option one or option two haven't taken place, then you just go with a testing plan. And lastly, and the testing plan, the two week testing plan covers all three of those uh, domains. The last one, option four is let's say you have you did a 10k race and you or, or a 5k race and you might have tested two minutes you know some you know weeks before a couple three or four weeks before that 5k well really all all it's missing is that middle domain nine to 12 minutes you just add that in and you're good to go so um if you are aware of your um your key domains and when the last time they were tested, option four may indicate that you only need to do test at one or two domains instead of all three. And I, I'm really glad you bring these points up because it speaks to the uh, relative ease of creating a valid power, power duration curve, meeting those criteria. Uh, once you understand how this works, once you understand those three domains and their durations, Really, um, it's just a cycle that keeps going. Like you, like you show in that graph of just, just the upper spiral of fitness, uh, throwing in a test here and there every four to eight weeks. It's, um, you know, it really creates that uh, tremendous momentum, uh, knowing when you're improving, uh, getting those updated training targets. Those updated training targets are leading to improved uh, you know, plan execution. And, you know, that upward spiral, it just kind of is like a flywheel that drives itself once you really understand the criteria and, you know, get the ball rolling. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, once, once you're doing these plans and you're following with another plan, you're set up. You, you don't even have to worry about this as long as, you know, one plan is not following by the, the previous plan by, like, 10, 16 weeks or something like that. If you're following a plan with another plan within four weeks or something, you know, close like that, um, you're, it's all taken care of. It's within the plan. So next, we know about the plans. We're excited to get started. We've got our accurate auto-calculated critical power. Now it's all comes down to choosing a plan. How do I pick the plan that's right for me, right for my goals? And you touched on the plans um, a little earlier, and I want to dive deeper into you know, that right level, what is the right level for me? Okay. So um, there are a number of different uh, things that, that you can do to make sure you're stepping into the right plan. One, um, and this is one of the new features in these plans is, is the levels, which are based approximately on your, uh, your critical power in terms of watts per kilogram. So, you know, if, for example, you have a, uh, a 3.0 uh, watts per kilogram critical power, it's suggesting that level two plans are probably right. And I've, I've seen people, well, I, I've got 3.4 watts per kilogram uh, critical power, but I think I can do a level three plan can I do that? Yeah, you can do that, but you really, you, it's, you want to check your critical power. You want to look at the number of runs per week, because if you're used to running four runs per week, then you don't want to step into a plan that's six runs per week. You want to stick with something that's four runs per week because that extra day or even two days is, is adding load that you're not used to. And when you add load too abruptly, too much, what happens? Injury. So uh, you want to pick your critical power. You want to pick your runs per week. And then like this diagram here, take another look. Look at the starting, look at the starting values. Like for, for example, let's look at level three. Your easy runs start at 25 minutes and progress to 30 minutes. So you want to look at the starting point. How you where where you step into the plan because you don't want to step in over your head. So uh, workouts are 35 minutes to start. Long run is 50 minutes to start. This is looking at that level three. 
Um, the weekly volume, depending on the runs per week, uh, five runs per week, is starting at two hours and 40 minutes for that first week of the plan. Um, and then you can um, look down uh, in some of these, these charts um, here, and you can look at the, the intensity uh, or the workout, the higher intensity workouts, what the volume is for those. So primarily look at your CP, look at your runs per week, and that's going to get you in the right ballpark. And then you can fine tune it by looking at the starting point of these various uh, plan levels. And the, the key thing that I'm asking is don't put yourself in over your head because that's just going to create injury. Jump in at the. Thanks, Steve. And then we have the levels. And of course, we also have the different plan types. We have options between build, maintenance, and racing plans. And could you take us through, you know, why I might choose a build plan or a maintenance plan or a race plan? What is the, you know, how should I decide which plan should I pick uh, based on where I'm at in my training cycle? Okay. So um, race plan, I'll start there. That That's pretty um pretty um, self self describing it it it's going to build your fitness with the target of a goal a race it's going to progress your fitness gradually hopefully in a very safe manner so injury avoidance is is a, a prime um, prime factor towards that that goal race um, a build plan is intended for someone that may have been coming off of an injury and they have, or they haven't trained for a while. They're not ready to step into that, that race plan at the beginning, that, that topic we just got through discussing. A build plan is going to start you at a level below the race plan start point and gradually build you off, build you up so you can step over right into the race plan. That's the way the, the build plans are designed to gradually build fitness so it hands off relatively seamlessly to a, a, the beginning of a race plan. Um, and then a maintenance plan is, um, is sort of a bridge between, let's say you did a race plan and the next race uh, plan doesn't start for, say, eight weeks and you just finished the plan. A maintenance plan is going to drop you off of off of what the peak was for the race plan but not down to rock bottom it's going to keep you at a level so you can step right back into a race plan it will hand you right back off into a race plan again so it it drops your your training level a little bit off of the peak of a race plan but maintains that fitness so you can start right back into a race plan And one of the major breakthrough, and I think really one of the most innovative features of these plans is the ability to sequence and in terms of, you know, choosing between different plans. But really that's the wrong question because it's not like I'm choosing between this plan or this plan. It's really, how do I sequence these plans? So they're all complementary. How do I build out my you know training goals for the year in terms of my A races, B races, and C races? And um, I want to do a deep dive into sequencing, sequencing Sequencing these plans. How do I choose one? And then after I complete that, what plan should I pick next? Yeah. So um, the there's a number. I mean, it it's almost limitless how you piece these things together. Um, but here here's an example um, where let's say the person hasn't tested. They start with a test plan, um, and then they they want to build gradually to uh, a race that's somewhere somewhere down the line they're going to enter a general build plan then go into the race plan then recovery maintain then back into another race plan and recover so 
every every aspect of that there there is a plan type that allows you to to string these two things together and sequence them together And this is just one framing. If we move on to the next framing, uh, there's many different ways you can sequence these together. For example, here's an example of race, recover, and then race, recover again, where you might not necessarily need to put in a maintenance phase or you know, take any time off. If you have two consecutive races, you can sequence the plans in a way that you can execute both those races and just keep building on your fitness. Yep. So another thing that this slide demonstrates is once you've entered the plan, your, your testing is incorporated. You don't need to go through another testing block if you're jumping race, then a recover, and then you're right back into a race plan. You don't need to retest at the start of that next race plan. And another really powerful sequence here is the race maintain race sequence, where you might not necessarily have a race goal immediately after you finish one race. So you can just jump into a maintenance plan to bridge that gap and then until you're ready for the next race target. Yeah. And a good example of this might be uh, a, a you know, person doing a spring marathon and a fall marathon. Um, you, you, you test some time in, in, in the winter, go into your plan, you run your spring marathon, you do your recovery from that marathon. And then let's say the next marathon plan doesn't start until the you know, middle of June or something. So you've got that six weeks or whatever. Um, after your recovery, you go into a maintenance plan. So that's a, a good example of uh, you know, how that this particular sequencing would work. And moving on to the final section here is modification. I have selected my plan. I am uh, now reality is set in. I might have to make changes. I might have to deal with life, I might have to deal with injury. So how do I make these critical changes to my plan to really tailor it for my circumstances or whatever other external factors happen? Yeah, so, um, you know, life happens. Um, the, you know, I set up a plan with, you know, Workouts are on the X, Y, Z dates or, you know, Tuesday, Tuesday, Friday or something like that, or Tuesday, Thursday. That doesn't work for that person's work schedule. First thing, if you're going to move things around, don't put back to back high stress or high RSS days. You don't want to do a, a, a long run and then come back the next day and do a workout or two two back to back workouts. So, Shift things around. Try to have at least one easy or off day between workout days or between long run and a workout, workout day. Um, so that's, that's one thing as you start manipulating things on your calendar. Um, another common one is, yeah, I could, I, this plan looks great. I, I could use a little bit extra volume. Well, here's an important uh, part. If you remember that that one slide earlier that showed the 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 load progressions, you don't want to add volume one week and not every other week. So so you want to preserve those load progressions. So you're not getting a big step from one week to the next or so on. So. If you're going to add load, let's say you're going to add five minutes to every, every easy run. You want to add five minutes to the easy run, add it to everyone in the plan. If you're going to add 10 minutes to a workout day or 10 minutes to a long run, everyone in the plan should be progressed in the same way by adding volume. All right. Um, triathletes, um, you're not going to do two high intensity workouts per week and a long run that incorporates some higher intensity work. So typically for triathletes, it's one easy day, one higher intensity day, one longer run day. And so you're going to have to subtract things out. And um, I, I think in triathlon, um, if you look at it, the, the workouts 
if it's two workouts per week, one of them is a little bit higher intensity than the next, you might want to drop that higher intensity workout and just keep in that, that one that's still higher intensity, but it's not quite as high as the pre previous workout. So you're going to whittle things down to one easy run, one, one workout, one, one long run, or one easy run and then two workouts, but you're dropping the long run on one week. Uh, so there's ways of doing that for triathletes and, and, and uh, incorporating. That said, the plans, when I wrote these plans, I wrote them as run specific plans, um, but they can be modified. I've, I've had triathletes modify my plans uh, with success uh, in the past. Um, another uh, issue is testing comes up pretty regularly, um, about every four weeks in most of the plans. Um, so it goes build, 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 and in a three week succession, and then it drops, the load drops down a little bit, and then there's testing. Those would be the ideal weeks for if you're going to substitute a race in for a, a prescribed test. Um, uh, this this slide here um, explains the the you know or de defines what an A race, a B race, and a, and a C race. An A race is what you're hitting at the end of your your plan. It's maximum effort. You're going full effort uh, for that race distance, and your RSB. Um, it says TSB there, but in in stride ecosystem, it's RSB. You want it to be positive, about positive five to positive twenty-five, and your your you want to have your your CTL. That's your your forty-two day average. You want to see that ramp rate sort of drop down a little bit, so it's negative for only one to five days. The plans are built with that kind of taper in mind for the A race at the end. What we're talking about when we're subbing things in is a B race. A B race is is full effort. You're still giving a full go, but your your training load metrics are going to be such that you're not fully tapered. Your RSP is going to be slightly negative to slightly positive, right around zero. And you you don't want to have your 42 day average dropping off because that that means you're giving up training load that you're trying to build for your A race. So um, a B race works perfectly in substitute for some of these, these uh, prescribed um, testings. That said, if you're substituting a 5K in for a testing, that's, that's a piece of cake. That's the training load of the testing that I prescribe is similar to a 5K race. If you add in a 10K, then you have to worry about hey, how's that going to affect my, my training in the next few days? If you sub in a half marathon, which is a very common thing for someone training for a marathon, you, it's going to impact your training in that fall, following week to 10 days. And you have to ask yourself, what am I training for? I'm training for that A race marathon at the end. So is this half marathon really something to put in? Um, but Someone will say, well, you know, the half marathon, I could go and practice my fueling. I could go, you know, get used to racing uh, half marathon. Well, you do it as a C race. What you do is you look at the, the one of the long run prescriptions and you do plug in the, that prescription into how you're going to execute your half marathon. So you're doing the half marathon as a training, but it's not a full effort. It's at prescribed intensities just like you would in your long run and i think this is one of the most impactful slides and phrases for me in terms of modifying the plan is the phrase if in doubt leave it out because i'm always someone who wants to try and fit that volume in, fit that workout in when in reality it might be far more beneficial for me to leave the workout um, leave the workout out and not try and make it up um, can you talk to the importance of this phrase and this concept? If in doubt, leave it out, Steve. Yeah, I, 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 um, I love this this phrase. If in doubt, leave it out. And the the underpinning of this 
is that no one workout makes or breaks your training plan. One work one workout make, make does not make or break your race performance outcome. So, if you're if you're on the verge of a cold, um, if your you know your your Achilles is bothering, you have a little niggle going on, um, leave it out. Now remember that spiral had consistency in the middle. Think of consistency in the long view, right? Not your day-to-day -day consistency, of course, that's important. But in this context here of if in doubt, leave it out, what you're trying to do is avoid the big setback where you, you try that workout and now you're, you're worse and you're losing a whole week of fitness, of training. So one workout is not going to make or break it if, if you're feeling on the verge of something or have a niggle, just leave it out. Then the question is, it always comes up is, okay, I missed that workout. Uh, I need to make that up. No one workout <laughs> makes or breaks your race. In fact, trying to make it up means now you're, you're sandwiching two harder things, uh, workouts or a workout and a long run too close together, and that's going to create problems. So my recommendation, don't, if you miss a, a, a key work, a, a workout, don't try to make it up. Just leave it out, go back to the plan and, and, and continue on, hopefully recovered from your, you know, your almost becoming ill or your, your, your niggle. Um, and lastly, if you're missing a whole block of things, let's say you miss a week, whether it's because of illness or injury or or work or what have you, um, I would I would caution very carefully about say okay, well I'm on I miss week five, I'm just going to jump to week six in the training plan. Eh, may you, you may not that may not be the best idea, uh, depending on how how uh, impactful that injury or illness was and how much time. It may not be uh, uh, fruitful. It may not be wise to jump ahead because that can just propagate the whole problem. Yeah, it brings me back to the uh, phrase you said earlier and let the, let the fitness come to you, let the spiral come to you where you don't try and jump ahead in the spiral. You don't try and force ahead in the spiral. If, if you've got that great momentum, uh, just write it, just write it if you miss a workout and that momentum is going to keep going. And then if you miss too much, don't try and jump ahead in the spiral simply because the work has been missed. Yeah. And I'm just going to come back and, and emphasize another prior point is keep the easy days easy. The, 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 the easy days have a purpose of, of, of giving you aerobic stimulus, but the key part of an easy day is, is that it's bridging you to your next hard workout. And if you go too hard, either in a prior workout or in the easy, it's going to impair the next one. So um, keep easy days easy. And, and th then maybe you don't get into this scenario of if in doubt, leave it out. And uh, truncating a plan. So I think this is a, a question a lot of runners have had in that, you know, I have a race coming up in, you know, four weeks, five weeks, you know, can I get a plan in there? How, how do I truncate it? What should I be aware of when tr truncating a plan? Um, yeah, what's your advice on this, uh, Steve? So I, I'm, I'm going to uh, let the listeners or what, viewers know that, that, um, that we're still... Uh, tweaking this and enhancing this. I, I just spoke with Michael earlier to, to really, really get this, the, the plan truncation really coming really well. Um, and, and I'm very confident that it's going to uh, get there really well. But when considering shortening a plan, look at, look at the, the diagram on the right-hand side of the screen. That's the training load progression that the plan uh, inherently has. Let's say we, we take out the, let's say you just did a testing plan 
and you take out those first three weeks, what's that fourth bar? That fourth bar is a testing week. You're going to go from testing plant, testing week to testing week. So um, let's say you truncate it so you're missing the first four weeks. Then you have to consider, am I ready to go into that, that week five, that bar there? Maybe your, your, your existing bar is just shy of what that first bar is on, in that diagram. And that's your current trading load. And you're jumping all the way up to what that bar is on uh, in week five. It may be too big of a jump. So you have to be careful when truncating. Are you creating a big jump from where you are now to where you're jumping in the plan at? And then the other thing is, is you have to consider if you're truncating plan, are you missing uh, important uh, testing or changing the testing frequency? Um, those are all things that we're, we're fine tuning, but be aware of that uh, as you're uh, in hoping to truncate a plan. There may be a case where, you know, you, you have a marathon plan and you're going to just catch the last six weeks of that marathon plan. Yeah, it's not going to work. It's, it's not advisable. And Steve, I'm glad you brought that up. We are working on a number of updates to take the plans to an even higher level of uh, user experience for all the different uh, scenarios runners are running into. And if you're ready to get started with a training plan right now, uh, you can find that in the Stride mobile app. Download the Stride mobile app. Of course, if you don't already have it, um, go to the calendar tab, hit the plus button, select a training plan. You're going to have access to all these great options, uh, testing, maintenance, build, race plans, and you can get started today. And executing the plan compatible with the Stride workout app on Garmin watches and the Stride app on Apple Watch. You'll be able to import those workouts in, start executing it. And on other watches, you can always build the workout on those watches platforms, such as if you have a Coros watch or a different brand, you can always bring those workouts in by building them on that platform and then executing on your watch. And for some of the customization options, uh, the Stride membership is going to help you do that. Uh, modifying the training, modifying the workouts, adding duration, volume in. If you want to make those changes with the Stride membership, you're going to have access to the workout builders. You can uh, up, modify those workouts and tailor the plan further to you. And now we're going to be taking some questions. So we've already had some tremendous questions come in. Uh, we've had a lot of great questions. So I'm going to be serving these up to Coach Paladino here and answering these. Let me grab a... Let me grab one of the top questions we've had here. So here's a question about uh, environment, environmental factors. So uh, this is from Stephanie. I'm curious how to manage critical power slash structured workout targets in my training plan as weather jumps from 65 degrees Fahrenheit to 80 degrees Fahrenheit the next day. Uh, what kind of strategy should runners employ as the weather has massive swings here. We're in the spring. Um, you know, the weather can be unpredictable. Uh, what's the best way to execute the training plan under those conditions? Well, uh, here's another area where, where uh, behind the scenes Stride is doing a, a lot of work to, to make this uh, uh, less of a, a question. For example, if you have Apple Watch, I think there's already real-time adjustment of, of your power target based on your uh, temperature. Um, there, uh, and I know there's some other work going on behind the scenes to, to, to help make this so you don't have to think, you just, you just follow the, the, the app and so forth. But um, the one day to next, you're going to adjust targets down. You're, and there's, there's a superpower calculator. It, allows, it has a, a calculator that allows, allows you to do that. Um, and convert your targets based on your temperature. And the, you know, there's I I've got uh, a playlist of very super power calculator tutorials. But on a longer term, weather changes. You know, let's say weather changes over a three week period. You know, it was cool then, and now it's warm now. That's another reason why building the testing into plan. You know, about every four weeks for most plans. It allows it to capture those. So let's use a, a warming environment. You, um, you, you may not, uh, it may, 
the, the temperature may be warm and you may test and you may not get the same uh, performance outcomes that you had in cooler, but you're going to more accurate uh, critical power versus where that temperature is right now. So testing helps solve some of this, um, but in between testing, you may have to do some corrections. And then the last part of that is um, Stride is, is working on incorporating this where you don't even have to go to a calculator and figure out what, how do I adjust my targets and into where. Here's an interesting question. I, I imagine there's a few different approaches to this, uh, to answering this one. But the question is, if I need more recovery, would it be a good idea to do two load weeks and one recovery week instead of three load weeks and one recovery week? So essentially, uh, you know, dropping one of the load weeks in in order to increase the relative recovery time. Um, Steve, how would you how would you approach something like that if if a runner feels like more recovery is needed? Oh, that's that's a very thought provoking question. Um, there's there's more than one way around that. Another another way is that you you all three load weeks, you just cut back a little bit from what the plan describes. You may, it may be you do one less rep in the, in the intervals that are prescribed, or you, um, or you do, you know, five minutes less in the long run. It depends on the importance of the long run and marathon. You don't want to cut that if possible. Um, but rather than go, two loads and then two because the, the testing week is is the fourth week in that sequence and that is reducing load right there so i might rather than doing uh dropping just week three load maybe drop you know the all three weeks in the, that load progression by the same amount so you're still getting the load progression but it's just not as aggressive um and then you still have the fail safe of that, that, that testing week. And that, that testing week is, let's say you're, you're at the beginning of that week, you're going, hey, I'm still a little ragged here. Then cut back on the beginning of that, that, that testing week, because that's, that's where you, we reduce the load in that testing week. Uh, we have had a number of questions on, for example, uh, between race plans, what should I do before between race plans is necessary to do testing. Uh, some of these things we covered. So if, um, if I don't take your questions, not because I, 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 I uh, don't think it's a good question. It's that we we've covered it with, um, some of the plan sequencing or modifications or, you know, modifying it for triathletes. So, um, I well, encourage I'm you to, do... I'm, I'm going to just put in one little, um, one, one little recommendation here. If you finished a plan and in that plan there was some testing or you did a 5K, 10K race, um, and that, that all happened within four weeks, six weeks of starting a new plan, then you don't need to test. We covered that in that one slide. Here's a here's an interesting question question um, from Oliver. Do the stride plans offer warm ups for races? Uh, effectively, what should my warm up be ahead of my race? Uh, yeah, I I uh, that's a that's a new feature of these stride plans versus the plans that I I've previously had in Final Surge. These all have uh, optional slash recommended warm up. Meaning, you know, you if you have a particular warm up, you could override it. But there's a warm up with a structured wo workout built into it in every race plan, at least for the A race. That is. Here's a question from Bert: The intervals I did this week in the new plan had a 12 minute warm up, and but the cool down was only four minutes. Why is this? I ended up extending the cool down with eight more minutes and even ran easy a bit longer. So um, basically the question as I read it is, uh, what determines a warm up versus cool down duration? And 
is it, should I extend the cooldown if I feel like it's necessary? The um, the uh, the warm ups are are pretty much standardized, and they're they're um, they're the mo they're the of the two elements the cooldown and the warm up. The warm up is the most important, so you want to follow that warm up. Um, at the end, some of the some of the cooldowns are relatively short, like you say, four minutes in that that particular session, because I'm trying to keep the overall load of that day to a set duration, um, a set load. So we keep the 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 weekly load progressions uh, 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 stepping appropriately so every the low progressions are right so sometimes the the the, the cooldown is a little bit shorter now if you need to extend the cooldown a little bit um, uh, that's fine but be be careful that you're not at uh, for the whole week not jumping your load up too big relative to the prior week Here's a question from Andre. Uh, for triathletes, would it be worth taking a level below what I'm capable of when creating a new plan? For example, let's say my critical power deems I should select a level three. Would it be worth taking a level two uh, to lower the volume and you know add in my you know my my cycling, my swimming uh, workouts? Uh, I think that that is uh, one one strategy that would would work pretty good actually. Um, uh, keep in mind, you know, the intensities are, you know, you, when you do a, a, a interval workout, for example, the intensities are going to be very similar, very similar stimulus. Um, uh, but you, what, what you're changing is the overall load and that may fit in, in the, uh, triathlete, uh, paradigm where you're, you're doing other disciplines every day. And uh, the, the higher load of, of level, say level four, uh, may not be uh, may may not fit versus the, the load of level three. I've got a question from Rick here. I think this is a really fantastic question. I think it's a good question for us to close out on. Uh, Rick asks, this may be a question, this this question may be impossible to answer, but if someone has a critical power dialed in well. How often can a person expect to increase their critical power as part of a training plan? Could a person see an increase every five to eight weeks? Um, you know, I assume it's it's hard to increase your critical power once you get to a certain level. I'm currently working to try to qualify for Boston and trying to figure out if I can get there in 1.5 to two years. Yes. Yeah, so the 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 answer. Um, is that there's a lot of variables involved. Now, before I get into that, um, Gus, at the beginning, uh, talked about a prior webinar um, in terms of assessing uh, progress and so forth. Um, go back and look at that, that particular webinar. Um, now, as far as what how much growth in your CP can you expect? Well, it depends on how close you are to your theoretic maximum. I mean, if you have someone that's been training for, uh, you know, eight years and they've been doing structured training um, and they're racing pretty regularly, they're going to see very small increments, if at all, depending on their age as well. So there's another variable. So training history, the age, uh, uh, the, the all are variables that determine growth. If you have a runner, a runner that's been running for one year, and they enter a structured training program or a structured plan like this, you may see eight percent within the plan. But you have someone that's been running for you know ten years, and you know they're a two forty five marathoner, they may see one percent or two percent growth. In their CP, and that would be great. Um, so there's a lot of variables: age, training, uh, st the structure of the training, um, are all, and, and then also, 
when is that plan occurring? If it's if if you're training in a warm weather where it's getting progressively warmer, you may not see, your your CP may not change one bit. But it's it relative to the temperature. It it's if you went back and, and temperature corrected the CP, you'd find that hey, my CP did grow during this plan, even though uh, in terms of absolute values it hasn't changed much. But relative to the environment, it has improved. And for the title of that webinar, that one is titled Stride Webinar, Setting Achievable Trading Goals with Stride. So you can search that and find it on YouTube. We'll also update the description of this video uh, so that it's featured there as well. That covers that covers everything, Steve. Uh, thank you so much. That truly was a deep dive into Stride Trading Plans with Coach Steve Palladino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and that was uh, that was fun going through all those uh, those talking points. And yeah, if in doubt, leave it out. <laughs> that's a um, that's something I we should almost just feature in a banner on the Stride Power Center uh, when you're selecting as you're modifying the plan or making any changes. Um, you know, just such a great reminder. And I hope everyone walks away with some you know really impactful you know. Thoughts like that they can use to when they're when they're picking their next training plan, making their next change in order to uh, help you quicker and better achieve your goals.